Thank you for that very uh, fun presentation. So my job over here is very simple today. I'm just going to negate everything that Alex says. That was a plan that we had from before. <laughs> All right, so um, my name is Imran. A bunch of you know me. I'm from the EPA, National Center for Computational Toxicology. And this title was given to me by, by um, um, Barry. So I've, I've, because I'm talking about biological complexity, I've, I've included a complex network over here. I think that covers pretty much all the complexity I'm going to get into. But um, all right, so I'm going to take a cue from what Alex started out talking about and maybe take it to a slightly different level and a higher level in terms of toxicity and biology and systems and what we're really talking about over here. Why is it difficult to predict toxicity? It's because the pathways are really complex. That's my sort of position. Why? Because chemicals are used in various ways. We get exposed in various ways. Those exposures lead to various levels of the chemical accumulating in various target organs in different differential amounts that bring about differential molecular changes that bring about all kinds of complex changes in cell phenotypes, their interactions, that lead to some sort of histopathological changes that ultimately manifest as toxicity. Right? That's our abstraction, an oversimplified abstraction of how you go from a chemical which is all dose dependent, of course, life stage dependent, genotype dependent, all kinds of factor dependent. That's why it's so hard to predict. So these adverse outcomes arise out of a complex sequence of events. There's multiple levels of homeostatic regulation, and that gets almost always forgotten. We never really talk about the levels of homeostatic regulation and what really is going on. Overtoxicity can be diagnosed, but the incipient changes that happen way over here at a molecular level, genotype, transcriptional changes, protein level activity changes, very, very difficult to identify which ones are really predictive of. And there's a reason for that, I think, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. So these adaptive, when, when toxicity actually happens, it's because these adaptive responses are overwhelmed. And one of the challenges that we face is this, how do we differentiate adaptation and adversity? That's, that's an underlying thing that we cannot ignore as we do all this interesting, fascinating predictive modeling. And so why yin and yang? Well, this is this challenge that we face at the one hand, the complexity of the system and the difficulty in understanding what's going on. And then the real problem, we have 80,000 chemicals. They're evaluated not based on information over here, although it's changing for the EDSP program. We now look at changes that happen over here and receptor activation, and use that to, to prioritize chemicals. But mostly we must get animal toxicity data and regulate our chemicals based on uh, uh, toxicity observed in animal studies. So the question is, how are we going to rapidly screen thousands of chemicals, right? So I'm going to be focusing on these two topics and talking a little bit about um, um, how we're going about doing it and what the over overarching paradigm is for doing, doing this. And that is high throughput toxicology. If you recognize, this is actually a slide stolen from uh, the Institute of Systems Biology. Which, which basically talks about the iterative process in which you go from cell-based systems, you perturb them with chemicals, you uh, conduct high-throughput assays, measure complex system responses, generate large-scale data sets, uh, uh, analyze these data with, with, with sophisticated computational algorithms, potentially predictive models, and come up with predictions about what the mechanisms are for the chemicals, what putative toxicities might arise, and then also estimate the kinds of potencies at which you would observe those adverse effects. OK, so this is the overarching paradigm that we're using. What are we really trying to do at the NCCT? One of the key challenges that we face in screening these chemicals is developing a tiered approach to actually figure out which chemicals are bad, how to figure out how, how to test them in, in, in some sort of tiered and pragmatic sort of way. So we're coming up with a high throughput initial tier 0 screen that I'll talk about very briefly from which our goal is to figure out what the chemicals that are non-selective and then figure out which chemicals are selective. That is, which chemicals act via certain receptor-mediated mechanisms like endocrine disruption uh, 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 or other specific pathways for which we know that there's a specific health risk because they're associated with some adverse outcomes. Once we actually figure out which chemicals are selective, the goal is to use the existing battery of in vitro assays to confirm those particular mechanisms and then further evaluate those and estimate the point of de departure using these either organotypic assays or maybe do targeted testing in vivo, potentially. 
But this also leaves open this whole question of what do you do with these non-selective chemicals? Now, one thing that's really different about drugs, potentially, although it could happen for drugs as well, and environmental chemicals is most environmental chemicals are, 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 are non-selective. And this is work that, that, that my colleague Richard has shown uh, uh, in, in a publication a year or so ago, in which he showed that a lot of environmental chemicals act via multiple mechanisms, and they don't act in very, very, they're not highly potent for those mechanisms. So this approach of finding selective chemicals may not actually work for the vast number of chemicals in commerce. So that, please keep that thought in mind as, as I go forward and start talking about um, um, how we're approaching things. So our tier zero screen, what is that going to be? Uh, you can look at different sorts of technologies that are out there right now. Um, and they have varying levels of maturity and acceptance. You could do metabolomics, proteomics. Uh, um, they have varying levels of cost, varying levels of actual uh, of validation in terms of being able to reproduce those technologies over and over again. And so what we've settled on uh, in terms of a tier zero screen right now is this um, high throughput transcriptomics approach that I'm going to talk about, um, um, hopefully, if I have time. But let me jump to the question of, what are we going to do with all this information once we actually get it? I'm going to come back to this question of, can machine learning solve all these problems? Um, so this slide is going to be a little non-traditional, and I'm going to go back and also talk about exactly uh, how this is consistent and inconsistent with the sort of ideas that, that Alex has, has mentioned. So if we look at all the data that we're generating in terms of um, high throughput screening data, uh, genomics data, transcriptomics data, any other sort of data, that exists over here in terms of molecular changes. So we take chemicals, we dose up cells with these chemicals, we, we conduct high throughput assays on them, we generate vast amount of information over here on what the potential molecular effects are, right? Chemical information is right over here um, um, at the far extreme. And what we're trying to do, what, what Alex described about doing is taking chemical structure information and making this immense mapping that goes all the way from the chemical structure down to, to three-year outcomes or lifetime outcomes in terms of toxicity. That's a really challenging problem. Not only is it a challenging problem, it's a really tough call to actually think about how is it that you can actually do that effectively and systematically. But the ideas are very similar whether we look at taking the molecular changes or chemical changes in the following way. And the, and the paradigm that links this predictive modeling together is basically machine learning, which is now you know, all the rage. But it's been going on for a very long time. So QSAR is the problem in which you go and go from take chemical structure as input and try to predict toxicity. When we're looking at gene expression-based data or other bioactivity-based data, Basically, we're applying the same methodology and going from these, this level of change into predicting toxicity or even predicting cell phenotypes. So in this, let me actually go back and, 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 and look at the problem that, that Alex talked about, looking at alerts versus QSAR. To me, that's a sort of one way of thinking about that is alerts are the presence. So each of these columns over here represent a descriptor. It could be a chemical structure descriptor, it could be a gene, it could be a protein, it could be a metabolite. And these outputs are these responses that you're trying to predict. So the input space over here is chemical descriptors. It could be the output space could be toxicity, could be molecular changes and, and, and the like. So the idea is simple that you take this input output data set and you try to use machine learning engine to build, up, build models with varying accuracies that can predict for any new set of chemicals what those classes would be. Now that I've generalized this problem in, in a way that I think we can begin to sort of uh, uh, compare different approaches with, let me go next to, why is it hard to do this for chemicals? So I'm gonna show a slide that looks a little bit like the slide that, 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 that Alex showed. Why is it so hard to predict um, um, outcomes from chemical structure? Here is a simple representation of uh, just a subset of chemicals that we have in DSS talks. It's about 8,000 chemicals for which we have data in terms of bioactivity from ToxCast, from Tox21, which is another project that generated large, about 40 or 50 assays, um, and also includes chemicals that have uh, uh, in vivo data as well. So basically, this is a visualization of 8,000 chemicals and, and, and Alex is right. The chemicals basically group in, in interesting ways. You have 
phthalates that are structurally reasonably similar, but when you actually look at them, they're, they're, they're reasonably close, but they're not sitting right next to each other on top of each other because of the chemical structure descriptors that they share with other chemicals. If you look at the bioactivities that these chemicals cause, here is a small slice of data for uh, NRF2 activation, NF-kappa B activation, P53 activation, and CYP1A activation, 1A1 and 1A2, from ToxCast. And you'll see that these activities are spread around the entire space. There's no real simple pattern that emerges in terms of the chemicals and how they relate to these activities. Now, okay, you could argue that this is not really a supervised analysis of the descriptor space, right? That, that if you were to conduct some really sophisticated feature selection and, and, and identify the decision boundaries in this space by using really neat uh, uh, global learning algorithms, that potentially you could discriminate them. It is true, but the, but the, but the point is that those, those representations of chemicals are very hard to find. To find a global representation that will actually predict activity, even molecular activity, is very, very hard to find. Um, let's actually overlay that same data set with, with uh, um, actual in vivo results. So here, what I've included now is the toxicity data from ToxRefDB, which is, again, a publicly available data database of, of guideline testing studies in which all kinds of animal toxicology results are recorded. And shown in, in, in red are the, the chronic hepato, hepatic effects uh, in mostly in rats. And negative are the ones that are, are the chemicals labeled with uh, 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 that do not produce chronic hepatic effects in rats. Again, as you as you see, the the, the the results are complex. The space of chemicals is very large. We have a very few number of chemicals for which we actually have some output data for. Um, and finding sort of generalizable uh, uh, models that can actually make such predictions is going to be extremely hard for us. So so it's. A question that, that, I, that I like the asking is, and the same for development, um, um, the relationship between chemicals, where they exist in sort of this high dimensional space of chemical descriptors and bioactivities, it's a really complex space. The most important question is that, and, and I think someone raised, Risa raised this question with me earlier, do we have enough data to be able to make empirical mappings with confidence and in a reproducible way? And, you know, I'll give you an interesting example. Um, AI and machine learning is all the rage right now. Yes, it is. And the reason for that is because we actually have millions and millions and millions of examples of faces, of, of, of handwriting, of pictures, of images that are labeled that we can actually build reliable models with. Just to give you an example, the MNIST data set that you guys may know about. It's a, it's a data set in which there are 60,000 images simply of the, the numbers from zero to nine. There are 60,000 examples, training examples, right? 60,000 of them. Each image is a 48 pixel by 48 pixel image. That gives you about 784 descriptors. It takes 60,000 training examples to build really accurate models of those digits with machine learning. If you reduce the number of examples, so what is that, the ratio? And now, now let's think about it. Digits on a piece of paper versus a complex biological system that is evolving dynamically over time and has this really dynamic trajectory. It changes in response to what you, what you hit it with. It changes over time. It changes by genotype. We're trying to classify that system versus we're trying to just recognize digits in, in, on a piece of paper. It takes 60,000. It's an order of magnitude, so two order of magnitude. So if you have 784 features, you need 60,000 examples to learn that, right? With a very, 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 very simple problem. If we're looking at a biological system, we will potentially need what? What do you guys think? Two orders of magnitude, do you need 1,000 fold more? Do you need, you probably need a million examples of a class for a biological system. I'm going to put that out there to be able to make confident, reproducible, global predictive models of those systems via machine learning. Now, that doesn't mean that everything is lost. So, some, an interesting conclusion that, that, that all of us that work on toxicology have come to over time is that.
global models may not work. We have limited bioactivity data, but maybe nearest neighbor local models can work in some cases. And, and my, my, my esteemed colleague is right. We have actually built upon the work done, really nice work done by Loetal, which is uh, who's a grad student, I believe, in uh, uh, Alex's group, and borrowed this idea of simple nearest neighbor based similarity, similarity weighted activity. It actually is really powerful. It works really, really well. And what's the idea? What this depicts is a chemical in the middle and its nearest neighbors based on time and motor distance. And if you want to infer activities, not just animal toxicity values, but also any kind of bioactivity values, what we find time and time again, even LD50 values, nearest neighbors are generally um, um, reasonably predictive of these bioactivity properties. Now, it's just because the data that we have are so limited and, and, and making global models is really, really hard. But the question remains, I would, I would pose that question. Potentially, there are global models that can work. Uh, the challenge is looking at the structure, chemical structures, looking at gene expression data sets, and trying to find the latent representation. So there's an underlying space at which these chemicals and their physical chemical properties truly do capture bioactivity. We don't know what that representation is. And when we do find it, when we get enough data, we will be able to make better predictive models of chemical structures. Okay, so I'm going to end soon, but let me just leave you with some, some ideas. So we're right now taking a very small leap. We're, we're taking a very, very small leap now in terms of making predictive models. We're taking our gene expression data, which is molecular perturbations in MCF7 cells. We have 2,200 chemicals, eight-point concentration response. We're generating data on about 21,000 transcripts and their expression, um, and we're generating about a billion data points, right? A vast amount of data. It's still pretty small. So it's 2,200 chemicals, uh, 21,000 genes. It's still, dimensionality-wise, we're off by a factor of at least 1,000 or 2,000. But we're trying to make a very simple leap. Can we take the transcriptional profile to predict the receptor or the, 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 the mechanism of action of a chemical based on labeled examples. And so we're taking three approaches to do that. Connectivity mapping, which you may already know about. This is actually nothing but a nearest neighbor algorithm that uses transcriptional space to make predictions about the similarity between the activity of two chemicals based on transcripts. We're using a pathway-based approach in which we're integrating pathway data from every source that you can to build this notion of super pathways. And using those super pathways, we're trying to figure out if a chemical hits a particular set of pathways, is it specific for a certain set of, of, of receptor-mediated activities? And finally, we're using machine learning, good old machine learning, to try this problem out. And, and there are some really interesting tricks that we can apply in that. Now, let me switch gears and say, OK, why will this, none of this work potentially? What is, what is the biggest reason why it could not work? Um, molecular profiling assays provide a snapshot of cellular state. It's just a single snapshot, right? The system is actually not static. I don't even, it's not even in a steady state. It's just not, not in a static state. So this is supposed to be, I don't know how many of you are familiar with attractive landscapes to so think about the landscape of, 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 of complex models. So the idea is this, that cells live in this normal range of function. When you hit them with a, with a chemical, they're their state evolves in this high dimensional space. And this is just a two dimensional representation of that. You undergo adaptive changes, you have some changes, but then you recover to your normal biological function. If you keep hitting the system with, with um, um, uh, the chemical stressor, you're going to undergo adaptive stress responses, but depending upon how much the stress is, you may still recover. And ultimately, there'll be a point of no return or the tipping point of the system beyond which you will basically not recover. So there are many implications of this. One of the things that it means is that um, when we take a snapshot of the system with, with 10,000 genes perturbed, how many of those are adaptive? How many of those are really related to the receptor-mediated mechanism that might be going on? We have to think about those, those issues. And um, we've done some interesting analysis of this to try to figure out whether you can find tipping points and use that information to actually um, um, uh, figure out what a, what a critical concentration of a chemical might be. Now, where is this relevant and what, the, what is the application for this? If you recall, I mentioned in the beginning that there are many chemicals for which you cannot find a, a, a very specific selective mechanism of action. 
Well, if you don't have a very specific and selective mechanism of action and you turn on these adaptive stress responses, then potentially we could identify concentration dependent transitions or these tipping points using data, using time course data, and figure out for these chemicals what those points of departure could be based on in vitro cell based data. And so that's our final thing. And this idea is actually we applied it to HIPG2 cells. We went on and studied this in a completely different model. So it's a mathematical, simple mathematical idea. We took that and applied it to uh, neuronal cells developing rat, uh, uh, neuronal cells, uh, uh, developing neuronal cells, and measured them with microelectrode arrays. This is work in collaboration with, with Tim Schaefer. And Chris Frank, uh, Chris Frank is the first author on this work who took the same exact methodology and identified neurodevelopmental tipping points. So even uh, cellular networks in, in, in vitro um, uh, exhibit these interesting adaptive behaviors and these trajectories that you can actually identify these critical transitions in. And, and the really important thing about these critical points is that they are about 10 times to 14 times lower than concentrations that produce cell death. So it's really interesting, the approach we've, now we're applying this to another model of, of, of rat hepatocytes and trying to see if rat hepatic tipping points can, can be used to, to, to how safe are they compared to traditional low Ls that you would see in subchronic studies and chronic studies. So again, let me summarize quickly. Um, 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 and I'm not sure if this summary will effectively capture everything that I've done. I tend to go off slide anyway, off the text. So. So high throughput data driven approaches provide an effective strategy for screening chemicals. There are limitations, but we can screen, identify potential mechanisms. We have a broad array of computational tools. Um, um, and the machine learning caveat is we need more data. Until we get more data, then we have nearest neighbor methods. And, and whether it's Mudra or Genra or Sibra, or there's another one, by the way, called Barbara. Do you know about that? Yes, OK. So there's a whole ecosystem of nearest neighbor methods, and everyone's trying to come up with their name of, of how, to, how, to, how, to, how to develop it. The key issue in using high throughput screening data is going to be differentiating adaptation from adversity in vitro. That's a critical question. If we can do that, then I think we can really look at the data and make some interesting predictions about it. So anyway, I'll stop with that and, and, and let Barry take things forward. Thank you. Thank you.